Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School World Order. I am your host, the Dallas professor, John Kleisick, author of School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. Welcome everybody back to the School World Order. I am your host again, John Kleisick, Dallas professor. It is my uh, very special privilege and honor to be hosting my friend Rahul Goswami today. Uh, Rahul uh, reached out to me after I wrote an article for Unlimited Hangout on UNESCO. Uh, it's titled uh, From UNESCO Study 11 to UNESCO 2050. Rahul is a UNESCO expert on intangible cultural heritage in Asia. Uh, he is a former advisor to the Indian government. In particular, he was an advisor to India's Center on Environment Education under the Ministry of Environment. He was also an advisor to the Ministry of Agriculture's program on traditional methods of cultivation, again, in India. Uh, he has studied and researched traditional knowledge for about 30 years. Rahul, thanks so much for being here. It is my pleasure to be hosting you. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to add about your background before we just get into some of the things that you wanted to share with me and the audience about UNESCO and the larger UN apparatus? Well, thank you, John. Namaste to you all. Thank you very much. Uh, John, I'm delighted to be on your show and uh, very happy to have this uh, collaboration with you to uncover uh, things that are of mutual interest to us and should be of mutual interest all around the world because education really is so central to what we try and do. No, I think this, this introduction is fine. Uh, and um, whatever has to come out, will come out in the uh, in our discussions that follow. Okay, great, great. Yeah, so uh, so let's kind of uh, jump right in. So Rahul wants to uh, break this down into three sections, okay? So first, he'd like to describe his work with UNESCO in Asia, uh, then with the FAO, and that is the... The Food and Agriculture okay. Organization. Okay, so... Uh, UNFAO. Right, okay, so uh, then Rahul wants to talk about the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, yeah. how, the, how the FAO ties into the Convention on Biological Diversity, and then on the climate-related subjects, so the sustainable stuff, SDGs and all that. Uh, he also wants to talk a little bit about the World Health Organization in terms of how they approach traditional medicine or the programs they have related to that. And then also, uh, he'd like to talk about how the World Trade Organization ties into this. And then also, I think this is the World Intellectual Property Organization. That's right. That's right. Okay. And then after that, he wants to take a look at what the United Nations multilateral method is how it works to homogenize the way countries, national governments manage the economic and social sectors, especially including education. Okay, and then the last part would be solutions, basically, right? So the last part is basically solutions. So what can different communities, cultures, societies, uh, what can they do? So then uh, if we could start off real, real briefly, just sort of, uh, if you could provide us just a brief overview of uh, UNESCO projects in Asia generally or, and or in India specifically. Thanks, John. Um, so what I'll do is uh, describe uh, the way UNESCO approaches uh, from the cultural sector, the question of what is traditional knowledge and what to do with it, where it is found. Um, so this is a relatively more recent part of my work. I've been associated with UNESCO Asia and uh, for some projects, UNESCO headquarters, which is headquartered in Paris, France, uh, for the last 12 years. The subject which uh, UNESCO names is intangible cultural heritage, uh, which is a bit of a different uh, way of describing what uh, in my part of the world we more commonly call traditional knowledge or local knowledge or local and indigenous knowledge or what i believe uh, in north america is uh, also called um, folkways um, folkways or living cultures or uh, the old simply the old ways um, so there are a number of terms and terminological concepts that are used. 
uh, UNESCO lumps this all together in its catch-all phrase, which is intangible cultural heritage, which I have to say is quite a mouthful, uh, and itself comes out, out, out of the English translation of the French original. <laughs> so that's really, uh, you know, you, we are jumping many steps in interpretation. Nevertheless, in 2003, uh, UNESCO doc, well, uh, condensed all of this into a convention. UNESCO works through its cultural conventions and through its social and educational conventions. And uh, this has been the program that I've been associated with. Um, the reason that uh, I was given entry into this is because of my prior work on traditional knowledge systems in India, uh, primarily in the areas of Central India and Northeastern India, which are heavily tribal. There, there are very large uh, sections of the territory that uh, are inhabited by tribal societies going back hundreds and hundreds of years and uh, their abilities to understand, live with, and uh, be in harmony with natural rhythms and processes is something that really should give everybody cause for wonder, not just where the way I saw it and experienced it in India, but where, wherever in the world it is. And that's the reason why I um, entered into this program with UNESCO. Uh, However, because of the, the way uh, UNESCO's work is structured, I as an Indian national did not work in my country with UNESCO on this. Uh, I worked in many neighboring countries of Asia and some further countries as well. Um, the main work, uh, so to put it, was the implementation in those countries of this UNESCO convention. So uh, the way that works is that these countries approach UNESCO and say, we'd like to carry out work in our countries on this convention, which we believe we have a lot of uh, traditional knowledge that can be better protected. Please help us uh, to do this. Uh, and what thereafter follows is that UNESCO asks its experts like me would you be able and willing to go to this country and do this work? And if we can, we say yes. And uh, then we enter into an agreement. Uh, what is it to be done for how long and what the outcomes are? So this is very much a government to UNESCO agreement, which is facilitated by the expert. Um, and this could be a facilitation in the direction of training. So you train people from the country, uh, mainly, at least at the outset, these are government officials so that they understand what this convention is and what it tries to do and what their job is. And then subsequently, uh, other parts of uh, the community, which I consider the most important. So these are what we call the knowledge bearers or the knowledge holders. They can be researchers and academics as well. And there can be um, NGOs, uh, think tanks, philanthropical foundations, all sorts of people really. So this is really the broad structure of uh, this convention on intangible cultural heritage under UNESCO. But I'd like to add that this pattern that I've described is, is largely common to the way UNESCO works on its other cultural conventions as well. And so, if I heard you right, then the the nation states, the governments, basically, they reach out to UNESCO, not necessarily the other way around. Well, uh, it's interesting that you put it that way, John, because the way I described it uh, formally just now is the way that UNESCO would also describe it, saying that a country, a country has approached us because it wants to implement our convention and we'd like this work to be done there. It's not always so. It, there is the UN system exerts, so the, the many agencies of the UN system exert considerable pressure on country administrations in order to fulfill their obligations to UNESCO or to other UN agencies. So therefore what you have is a system where 
a UN agency will say, look, you've signed, uh, you've signed up to this convention. Now you have to implement it. You haven't done anything about it for one or two years. Uh, and you better start doing something about it because uh, otherwise your um, non-participation in this convention and therefore in our agency is not going to look very good in other agencies. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we suggest that you start asking us for ways to, to make this work. That's uh, the backroom chat that goes on. The only reason I asked it is because I was curious as to whether or not, whether the nation states, the national governments, do they have more control over what is actually studied or the programs are run on the ground in their own countries? Or is it largely they have to implement, you know, the broader international stuff that, that UNESCO and the UN broadly wants? It's very much the latter. And this really, I think this gets to the heart of the problem that, uh, I was um, hoping to be able to describe to you and to uh, others who have uh, taken the step of identifying the problem and writing about it, because uh, this is really one of the reasons why um, I reached out to you having read your article, uh, because there is a great absence of, in fact, locating this problem and describing it for what it is. So it is very much the latter part of what you described, which is that the state, uh, I mean, I'm calling it a state in terms of a country. So the state administration, the ministry, et cetera, they are in the, in the position, the unhappy position, I would say, of being consumers of a package of thinking and practice, which is actually very sophisticated and which is uh, pushed into these countries by not only UNESCO, but all other UN agencies. So the control is not theirs. The content of the package is not theirs. The means with which to use it is also not theirs, but the obligation is all theirs. And so that, that sort of answers my, I was gonna have another question, which is, so to the extent that the national government is in charge of anything, then I was going to ask to what extent do they consult with or do they give some authority or some, some managerial control to like the, the various local cultures or local communities? Would the national government sort of defer to like the indigenous knowledge of you know, the different regions or is it sort of like the, the nation state is going to take this international program and then do like a one size all approach to the whole country basically. Um, yes, yes, that's uh, that's also a very pertinent uh, question, which really all, all administrations and all ministers especially need to ask, need to be asked at the outset and they need to provide answers because uh, in my experience, and I'm not just referring to these 12 years with UNESCO, but also uh, concurrently for a few years with FAO and prior to my UNESCO experience also with FAO, the um, considerations of local communities and local cultures is included, but only as a means to display by the UN agency to the rest of the world that we've done it. So it is in the nature of what nowadays is called the box is ticked. Have we had participation? Yes, you ticked that box. Have we had consultation? Yes, we ticked that box, et cetera, et cetera. So, have, so for example, in a tribal setting, have we got the tribal elders to come and understand what we would like and have they agreed on what we would like and have they given their consent and permission? Yes, they have. Yes, but this is not the nature of culture. And this, you, you know, so what then happens is what I described earlier is that your nation state becomes a consumer and you become a consumer through a forceful process. Submit to our process and we will endorse you. And I have to, uh, to say that, uh, you know, at, that, at the time, of course, I was, I was uh, certainly younger than I'm appearing to you today. Uh, I did believe that the UN agency stood for 
certain values and and uh, uh, certain I would say uh, inalienable um, concepts which are common to all cultures. And uh, therefore, I was happy to be included in this. Uh, when I began my work in in the Asian countries, I began to see by around uh, probably the end of the second year that uh, things are beginning to look rather different from what they have been presented to us as. Um, and uh, this, I think, uh, has been a process of, of learning what the multilateral system in fact stands for and what it pretends to stand for, which are two very, very different things. Yeah, it, you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, sort of, well, it's, well, well, the World Economic Forum calls it the stakeholder capitalism, I mean, as far as the, the broader approach. But on the ground level, you know, I teach uh, at the schools, you know, there's all this community-based this, community-based that, and then, you know, so then they have this local bargaining. But don't forget that when you're bargaining with your local constituents, that the other stakeholders get to have a say. And those stakeholders are like IBM, Microsoft, right? And so, like you said, well, we checked the box where we talked to the local people in the community. Uh, and, you know, we decided to go ahead and run with what IBM said because we would check off the box, right? And so it sounds very, very similar. Um, so let's go to the next question. Then. So you wanted to talk about other United Nations, uh, UN agencies, and then other NGOs or global governance institutions. And so maybe tell us about the UN FAO, so the Food and Agricultural Organization, maybe, maybe in particular the Committee on Food Security, or also the WHO, so World Health Organization, and or um, I think UNICEF might might pop up in there as well. Uh, any, anywhere you want to take that with any of those organizations. So le let's let's begin with uh, FAO, which um, uh, which is the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, which uh, really began its work very very early, um, the late forties, probably forty eight forty nine. Uh, and the primary reason for the FAO existing in the first place was supposed to be the food shortages, the current food shortages in that time in most of what was described as, uh, what was still described as the third world, uh, developing countries hadn't yet become a label. Uh, so certainly the third world or the newly decolonized world uh in fact some countries in africa at that time were, were still uh colonial subjects uh and uh if you if you strip aside what the fao said at that time that we are a multilateral agency set up to address the question of food shortages and uh crop failures in the developing world what you in fact see is a system which is designed to replace what exists in a country in terms of its knowledge and practices concerning food and crops by a system of food provision which is alien to that country, uh, which does not belong to its practice in any way, which has been composed by a group of experts who are foreign to that country, but who have a, a, a representation of interests in this, in, in this context, corporate interests, to be able to, within a generation, subvert the ownership of land, subvert the ownership of seeds, and especially subvert the ownership of the origins of knowledge. How do we cultivate for what and what is the cultural basis of that? So all that begins to be put in place by around the early 50s, right through the decade of the 50s. And once that is in place, that begins to be called the Green Revolution, which we experienced much to our uh, regret and much to our destruction, I would say, and there were several other countries. Mexico was a large uh, recipient of green revolution uh, technology. 
and uh, this went on until the late 60s when the shortcomings of those technologies became much too apparent to be able to ignore any longer uh, but the the principles of identify the local systems and begin a program to replace them within a generation if possible those are what i would say it common to many of the ways of working of the un agencies uh, so i've described it for fao because um, from an early age i was interested in 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 what grows and why is it grown in this particular way but also because uh, the the embedded knowledge of why it is grown and why do we do this is an essential part of what we would call education or the transmission of the knowledge and the 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 learning continuum which exists between the elders and the younger generation and this is something that uh, in in my experiences i began to see that is what is being attacked uh in very in, again in a very sophisticated way using a uh, neutral language or uh what is called progressive terminologies but that is actually what is being attacked and this is something that uh i think has been has still been only partially understood even even at this stage in 2021 70 years after uh it began to be visible uh it's in the in the same way unicef which is a very large agency of the un which has a very big budget and huge staff strength uh, they began to address the question of what is education what is being taught how is it being taught what are the systems methods etc as if they were talking to countries which never had what we call education in the first place i mean how did unicef imagine that we are all tabula rasa completely blank slates and tables upon which it can imprint whatever it likes I, you know i mean if you look at it that way it's frankly ridiculous and and it came uh, i would say the the entire the uh, the intent of the approach uh, i mean i have to say it as bluntly as possible had the the, the full impress of the colonial mind that these subjects have no idea of what is education and therefore we have to uh, take upon ourselves the burden of explaining what is education and how you go about it i mean for heaven's sake this was ridiculous and this uh, this was successfully positioned and packaged as a internationally uh accepted standard of expertise which as a subject agency of that particular un agency you were expected uh and you were obliged to consume swallow and uh, digest uh and this has happened in in every single one of the united nations mainline agencies um so fao yes you, uh, unicef yes the who uh, which has had a enormous role to play in terms of the organization of any particular country's uh, public health system um which is the way through which the uh, products of the uh, the pharmaceutical multinationals in fact finds their audience but these are audiences that are then guaranteed in the tens of millions and of course their expenses are underwritten by the state uh, which is unfortunate enough to receive this package uh, in the form of their annual health budget uh, a large part of which is is diverted into the payment uh, of, uh, to these multinationals for their products so what has happened again if you look at the who system in impose a standardized public health uh, framework in its subject countries completely remove all the indigenous local and uh, um 
traditional medicinal systems from that purview, don't do away with them, or rather don't advocate their doing away with, because that will fall afoul of the other culturally related work that the UN is doing, but marginalize them to the extent possible. Uh, so that the space is cleared for the MNCs to come in and um, deliver their products at the prices that they dictate. Yeah, yeah, you know, you think about if, if they're going to it seems like the only way you really could run sort of a standardized international system would have to be through multinational corporations because yeah. otherwise you'd have to defer to the locals and the indigenous culture and you know just totally do it the other way around right and so uh, a couple questions is so you, you mentioned that the fao sort of uh, is trying to help 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 with the countries food production and distribution or that's that is the premise right what have been the effects that you have seen as far as those projects so in other words do they actually help with either more production or better distribution or does it have a different effect yes more production uh on paper yes um what did happen i think uh, between the um, early 50s to the mid 70s, I would say, was that on paper, I mean, if you look at, you know, we had in India what was called a planning commission, which was a, a uh, system borrowed from the former Soviet Union, uh, which is this central apex planning agency, which devises the five year plans for the entire country. And uh, so, <laughs> you had this planning agency saying that well we've had uh, 40 million tons of uh, rice and 30 million tons of wheat by the end of the next five-year plan period we should have 55 million tons of rice and 45 million tons of wheat and just like in the soviet union uh, you had the through the balance five years from the end of one plan to the other you had the sort of graduated scale of outputs where uh, in order to, to maintain the semblance of progress, you um, delivered uh, successes plus minus 5%. Uh, so it was, you know, it was a matter of uh, statistical jugglery, if not outright invention. We, we never really, we never ever really understood what was being produced and how much. What we did know, what we did know, of course, because of the green revolution is that um, hybrid varieties of rice and wheat, which never ever should have entered our country, uh, let alone be experimented with in laboratories and turned into uh, the uh, um, varieties of rice, which have been distributed in their thousands. I mean, the varieties are the thousands of the hybrids. Uh, those, when sufficiently fed and pumped by uh, synthetic fertilizer, chemical pesticides, of course, have provided yields uh, which are larger than their predecessors, which were natural, organic, and native. Uh, and this this difference was explained as a result of our beneficial and altruistic interventions uh, as the world's um, premier multilateral agency, the United Nations, through our uh, enlightened crop scientists at the FAO, who are all scientists of international repute. Well, look, uh, we we in india we have been growing rice for longer than recorded history we have uh, in the uh, by the early 60s when records at a national level started being kept we had probably around 35000 major varieties of rice the lesser cultivars were numerous and in this great universe of the diversity of a single, a single genus of grain, to imagine that you know, a few dozen hybrids would somehow be able to outdo 
this tremendous legacy is frankly lunatic. So they produced more of a very narrow spectrum of the full yeah. variety. And so they can say, oh, look how much we increased, even though we actually lost all this biodiversity in the process. Yes, that is what happened. Because if you look at the uh, pattern of Indian retail consumption today, um, where um, our rice production, again, I mean, subject to all sorts of distortions uh, in terms of uh, how it's measured and weighed uh, is more than about 105 million tons. Yes, but 105 million tons of what kind of rice? And those kinds of rice from having been a, let's say a distilled number of which, you know, in every season, I mean, if we go back, let's say 50 to 60 years, in a particular rice growing season, not all varieties will be in fact uh, seeded and then harvested. It may be a quarter of the available varieties, but even a quarter would then be in the region of seven to 8,000 varieties. And today what you have in the markets is the great bulk of it is really no more than 20 to 25, 20 to 25. Yeah, they did similar things with corn and apples over here in the United yeah. States, if my memory serves me. Um, and, you know, it, I, it makes me think as well, you know, then there's other losses, not just to the biodiversity that has to result from that, but I just, my limited knowledge of how crop rotations affect or lack thereof affects the, the quality of the soil and the nutrients that the plants can actually get, right? So if you only have 20 types of plant, instead of 35,000, that means the soil, right, is, is gonna get depleted because it's, it's everything is so uniform as well. So, I mean, just the, the cascade effect of losing that biodiversity yes. under the guise of increase. And then my other, so then that leads me to another question, which is that, that thereby has to, has to affect distribution, meaning, right? If, if you're losing thousands and thousands of varieties that are gonna be particular to certain regions, then, then you're going to have to ship rice from another region to a place that was already basically self-sustainable. Am I right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that is exactly what happened. So we have this enormous, enormous uh, infrastructure called India's Public Distribution System, PDS, which involves a uh, huge number of uh, freight trains running around all over the country carrying rice and carrying wheat uh, from what are called rice and wheat surplus states to rice and wheat deficient states in order to somehow equitably distribute rice and wheat, completely forgetting meanwhile that there are many places in India which do not eat that kind of wheat that you are growing, which is surplus, and which do not eat that kind of rice which you are growing, which is surplus. Not only do they not eat it, according to their local cultural cuisines, those rices and those wheats should never be there. Yeah, I think you, and you mentioned something about, uh, what, what was the type of rice that, that they grow in Texas now? That they, <laughs> which, one, which one is that called? Yes, yes, which, which they had attempted to patent. So there is a, a, a long grained fragrant uh, variety of rice in, uh, in North India. And of course, what is today Pakistan as well, which is called Basmati. Okay. Uh, so uh, right from the late 80s to around the mid 90s, there were a few uh, companies, uh, some of which were based in the USA, uh, which attempted to patent this. And uh, the, there was one in the, the one which was in the USA was based on, certainly based in Texas because they decided to call it Tex Mati. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And weren't they shipping some of that back over to India as well and basically reselling it? Like, so taking your variety, growing it here, and then selling it back over there as well? Or did I, did I not remember that correctly? It may well have been possible because uh, by that time, I think, uh, unfortunately, the urban Indian uh, would not have been educated well enough locally to be able to know the difference between what is a local native variety of rice 
and what's coming out from the pristine laboratories of an American plant. He would probably think that the latter is better some way. If he's been listening to the UN propaganda for maybe. Um, yeah. One more thing I want to touch on here is, um, so you mentioned the, the, uh, the relationship of big pharma to um, some of these UN programs, and in particular getting into uh, the field of agriculture. And um, so, so did you basically see um, uh, big pharma companies trying to like patent, synthesize, or otherwise co-opt like indigenous medicines? Like I remember there was a time, I can't remember when it was, it wasn't too long ago, but where there was, there was an attempt to patent turmeric. And so did you see, was there attempts to, other than that example of the turmeric where they wanted to like patent or otherwise co-opt the indigenous medicines? Yes, uh, undoubtedly. Um, so I think it was around the um, late 90s, the mid to late 90s, probably 97, 98, uh, when I began making more extensive visits to, to uh, Northeast India, which is uh, uh, the part of India which is, lies between uh, Bangladesh, uh, the southeastern part of Tibet, and which adjoins Burma. So uh, there are seven predominantly tribal states there. Uh, these are in terrain which we call the Eastern Himalay. So the Eastern part of the Himalayan mountain range. Um, very rugged, very beautiful, very lushly forested and therefore uh, very rich in all kinds of biodiversity. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at that time uh, in when I was visiting two of these states uh, in order to pursue uh, some of my work on the traditional knowledge systems and their documentation. That is when I first ran into people who were talking about groups of, uh, of botanists and biologists who were coming from abroad uh, and who were scouring the forests of those regions looking for particular plants that they had been told uh, existed there and grew there in the wild. And that's when I first learned about this term called bioprospecting, uh, which uh, I think is, is uh, was for 20 years. I don't know whether it still is because of the ways in which uh, our forests have been um, overrun by these people, whether there is any scope for this anymore. But at that time, there were certainly groups of people uh, who would go to our forest areas, not just in Northeast India, but in Central India, and even close to where I live in Goa, where we have the, the Western Ghats, which is the range of hills, which runs all the way down Western India, which is also heavily forested. So there would be these groups of people who would um, systematically go to go into these forest areas looking for particular species uh, which they could then take back with them presumably to laboratories in the west and uh, I was told at that time that um, uh, some of uh, what were called the active ingredients of um, therapeutic medications which which deal with heart ailments which deal with with uh, cancer treatments uh, have in fact ingredients that have been sourced through bioprospecting uh, parties who have come to these forests and found what they're looking for. So there's, you know, other than uh, the well-known examples of the attempts to patent uh, basmati or turmeric or neem, uh, which is uh, a medicinal and uh, anti-pesticidal, uh, a pesticidal tree, there are many, many others which we, which have, you know, slipped off the visible radar of uh, 
what has uh, actually been looked for and extracted illegally because many of these forests are what we call preserve uh, the uh, protected forests or or what in, in the US you would call, I think, uh, natural reservations, is that right? Yeah, where, conservation, you know, something like that, yeah. yeah. or conservation zones, where, you know, unless you're a, you're a, a, a local uh, or you're part of the uh, ancestral uh, tribal community, you can't even get in there. Uh, but nevertheless, they found their ways in there. And uh, and spirited these uh, these samples away, and, and we wouldn't we won't even know about it because there's we won't no even media know. coverage on it. Yeah. We won't yeah we won't even know because the only way that they will then surface is then one or the other uh, pharmaceutical MNC will announce the discovery of a new breakthrough molecule. Uh, yes, but where did you get that molecule from? Right, and then they make it proprietary so they can charge yes. more for it, right? Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, in my opinion, you know, I, you know, and this is just my opinion, I, I personally don't think that any of those extracted or, or isolated molecules are as effective as when they come mm -hmm. in the natural form because I, I think that there's research that says a lot of times the vitamin, your, your body does not process the nutrients the same way unless they're in combination with the rest of its original source. So, you know, it's it's purely for, you know, proprietary and profit purposes. You know? So that that's my that's my opinion on that. Um, let's talk then about how the United Nations, the Millennium Development Goals have how they evolved into the sustainable development goals. And that'll sort of lead us into how how those both the MDGs and the SDGs have driven specific uh, either UNESCO or FAO or UNICEF programs. All right, John, I'll, I'll make an attempt at that. Uh, the the MDGs and their transmogrification, as Calvin and Hobbes used to say into the SDGs is uh, one of the, I think the horror stories of our modern era. Uh, it's certainly, if, it's, if it ever becomes a book of the size of war and peace, it will be classified as mystery thriller. Uh, the MDG stands for Millennium Development Goals. And uh, the accent at that time was on the D, development. Uh, and I, I would say development became a loaded word around uh, the late 90s and the early 2000s because once again, just like I was describing about the 1950s and 60s, there was the decolonized world, the countries which had emerged recently from the state of being colonized by, by Western powers. So, <clears throat> but there were also the question of having been, having emerged from decolonization, were they developed? And uh, this is, I would say, part of the, the programmatic questioning that began to be systematized through the UN agencies, but also through, uh, perhaps more so, through the academic discourse that surrounded what they did and which began to be encouraged in, uh, in the um, Ivy League and uh, equivalents around the world as to what is development, what are its constituents, who are its participants, uh, how is it to be seen and how is it to be measured, especially measured. And so the, the Millennium Development Goals really were centered around what is development. So there were eight goals which were described. Why those eight and why not others? Because uh, they had to do with you know, poverty, hunger, and so on, which were largely seen to be subjects common to 
uh, the state of deprivation that existed in many countries of the of what is called the global south or the third world and therefore they they were uh, they were perfect candidates to be uncontestable as as requirements how can you say that you don't want to address poverty of course it is part of your national goal how can you say you don't want to address hunger of course it's but how can you say that you don't want to address access to education what about water and sanitation what about uh, child mortality and so on uh, and these became uncontestable uh, you had you know it, it in terms of there being uh, labels so there so these were aggregated into the millennium development goals as being eight and uh, turned into programs um, which then were rolled out to many of the countries of the un system but of course their implementation uh, was um, driven in the again the countries of the of the former third world or still third world uh, so what we had was a very large, very well coordinated, extremely well publicized program called the MDGs under the United Nations, which then took on the appearance of being a United Nations program that was actually accelerating development of countries that had somehow lagged behind in the development race of the world. And that this program would then bring everybody to some kind of common uh, standpoint from which uh, then they would be able to afford the luxury of looking ahead and deciding for themselves what to do. Again, uh, there was a great deal, I think, of uh, artistic chicanery that was involved because once again, the assumption, the hidden assumption was that did these countries not have these goals in one way or another in what they wanted for themselves in the first place and did they not already have provided for these goals whether they were described as goals explicitly or not through their own means their own budgets and their own methods of revenue collection of course they did so what they what the the un mdgs successfully managed to do to convince a lot of the the uh, those who are active in this sector and those who are immediately outside, they managed to convince them that it is because of the MDGs that development in these 70 to 80 countries has progressed at a faster rate than if we were not there. This is completely untrue because every single country had its own means of assessing what it was lacking and its own means of deciding how to address that lack. What the MDGs did was to collate all these efforts, give them a umbrella term and say that it is under the auspices of the UN that all this is actually happening. Yes, but the money that is spent on any individual item in any individual country came from within that country, not from the UN. And this started becoming clear to me around uh, 2004 or so, when uh, in India there was a great deal of uh, noise about, oh, the MDGs are now in force and uh, our government ministries have to uh, begin learning about how to report to the UN on what they are doing for the MDGs. And I started looking at some of the reporting because I was already working in the area of agriculture by then. And of course, hunger was a big part of it. So was health. I was, uh, I had also done uh, some research on public health, especially uh, the role of traditional systems. And of course, health is a big part of it. And when I began to look at what is being reported and why is that particular kind of reporting being asked for, then it struck me that, you know, there is a great burden of reporting as well, which means that these countries, their ministries, have to depute people to learn how to report to the UN, which is not paying the money for those changes to occur in those countries themselves. So to me, again, it became the emergence of a state of 
ridiculous disconnection between the multilateral system and what was happening on the ground in any given country. There was this great uh, drama of interpretation, which then was um, inflated into this huge public relations blimp and balloon that was floated all around the world about the success of the MDGs. And of course, that having happened, the MDGs uh, uh, were, were supposed to span the period of 2000 to 2015, um, which was the conclusion of the MDGs. So by the time it was 2012, 13, uh, they had decided with, with good reason that their communications with what had happened uh, on the entire MDG program had been so well executed and so well thought out that the stage was set for a much bigger canvas. And by 2012-13, that much bigger canvas started being drawn and painted in the form of the wish list for the uh, successor to the MDGs, which became the SDGs, so the Sustainable Development Goals. So the millennium was dropped because the millennium was already now 15 years behind us. And sustainable was brought in because then we had the great big uh, promised land of Agenda 2030, 2030, which was beckoning in the distance. And therefore, we needed another mechanism to bridge these next 15 years and be, uh, lead to that. Yeah, you know, so it sounds to me like, so the, so the MDGs, basically, they, they throw these, these platitudes out, so they have this rhetorical justification for going into various countries, right, in, in the developing world, and then they come out there, and, you know, like you said, you have, you know, ho hunger, poverty, all these, you know, platitudes, and no one's going to say, what are you against, you know, feeding people, or are you against taking, you know, uh, uh, curing diseases? And so they get a foot in the door, um, but really all they end up being is sort of like a broker for like international finance and the multinational corporations. So, so, you know, helping with like, like the World Bank stuff with their structural readjustments, giving loans under the guise that we're gonna help you with education, healthcare infrastructure, but we'll, we're basically gonna micromanage how you do it and then, some of the things that are going to happen is we're going to go ahead and you know lower your your tariffs and your trade barriers. We're going to bring in these multinational companies. So under the guise of like international humanitarian aid, they really are just these brokers for these multinational corporations and these big banks. And then all they really do when they get there is teach or or rather manage how the people on the ground in the countries create some PR spin to make it sound like they're actually helping the situation so that the MDGs can be further justified and they can perpetuate until they get down the pipe where, you know, it's sort of like there's the MDGs is almost like this phase of, as you, as you said, development, you know, sort of spending money and building up and, and, and trying to putting all these programs in place that are, that are under the guise of they're going to add to the infrastructure, but when we get to the sustainable development goals, it really starts to become about rationing more than about like, you know, we're gonna help you produce more. We're gonna help you have, have more clinics. And then it's like, well, you know, this whole, uh, you know, these multinational corporations that we've been uh, brokering for, you know, this is not sustainable. So now we're gonna, now that we got all the programs in place, we're gonna go ahead and ration out who gets what, right? I mean, that, that's kind of how I, how I see the two flowing together. Right? Um, can you say more about the SDGs in terms of how they how they maybe are different from from the from the MDGs? Yes, um, I I try and explain um, the way I I've had to view them uh, from the inside, so to speak. You know, because uh, of uh, direct experience uh, with and through two ministries, two central ministries in my government. Uh, um, agriculture and then environment. But let me just read out uh, what I noted down, um, which will probably help the explanation a bit. 
Uh, the MDGs dealt mainly with what the United Nations called the 75 countdown countries. Again, you know, you see that uh, sexy terminology, countdown, uh, counting down to 2015, where they will enter the promised land of being developed in some way or the other, or it seems to be less developed. Um, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, with all the 193 member countries of the UN are a much bigger far more ambitious canvas. With its dense network of targets and indicators, the SDGs reached into the work of every UN agency, and indeed into the great majority of agencies and organizations that the UN agencies themselves work with or contract out to. And this is really a huge constellation of organizations including universities. So there, there are uh, innumerable chairs and departments which are set up in universities, especially in Europe, uh, and to some extent in North America and in USA and Canada, but in other parts of the world as well, which deal exclusively with, with, with questions of development and therefore the SDGs looms very large in their work. So uh, this becomes the great majority of agencies and organizations works with and contracts to. And because of that, there is again a massive uh, network of uh, NGOs and what are called CBOs, community-based organizations, which themselves, each individually in one, one way or another, are funded by uh, donor organizations or by the aid programs of donor countries in the West, um, which again come with terms of reference that are tied very closely and very strictly with the SDG goals and indicators and targets. So uh, I saw that by 2013, that's two years before the MDGs officially concluded, UN agencies like the FAO, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, the UNFCCC, which is the Climate Change Convention, UNICEF, and WHO had started incorporating SDG imperative language into their plans and messaging. That's when the next horizon was mapped out for us, which is uh, 2030 and the uh, Agenda 2030. Um, so uh, that's as far as the UN messaging is concerned. <coughs> Excuse me. How did it take shape? in a country which was uh, meant to be and supposed to be and treated as the recipient of this wondrous package. What we began seeing, <clears throat> I'm saying we as uh, from the inside of the ministries, was that the concerned UN agency will begin <clears throat> a steady stream of literature, material, videos, consultations, with ministry officials at whichever level they are available and can be contacted in order to begin the process of influencing the thinking and therefore the messaging that goes into the, uh, the makeup of administrative decisions uh, so that the, the goal at that stage for for uh, how to put it, an SDG operative who is part of a, a UN country staff. The goal at that stage is to be able to get recognition of a particular SDG and its associated targets and indicators in the official language, so which means in the government correspondence, intra-ministerial from one level to the next, till the point at which a decision can be made about the uh, content of a program of the ministry so that an SDG target or an indicator or even better, all indicators relating to a target then become the targets of that ministry that itself. Uh, and this began to be 
very clear to see already by around, uh, I would say, the early 2010s, the early 2010s, because uh, what we began to see is uh, climate had, you know, the idea of climate and climate change and, and, and so on had already begun to be pushed very high into the uh, visibility stakes uh, of any ministry and therefore its uh, policy makers and policy influencers. And I recall very clearly that around 2010-11, um, in, in those who worked with the Ministry of Environment like myself, we were being urged to think towards what is needed for India's national action plan on climate change, uh, which all countries uh, now have filed and many countries have filed revisions and, and newer versions and updated versions uh, and so on. It's been uh, more than uh, 12 years, 12, 13 years of that. So uh, at the ministry level and, and uh, for those working on the, um, the framing of the, the programs of the ministry, which would be either annual or in, in more often than not multi-year, this language was uh, stealthily introduced. And that the language that was introduced corresponded to the language of that particular agency's convention or program. And therefore, what we began to see is that over a period of 15 to 20 years, let's say the closing of the MDG stage till let's say 2020, we have in many countries, ministry language, so official communication, which no longer has <coughs> emerged from within, not from the ministry's officials and, and recognized experts who are local, nor from its own circuits of advisors who are also local, but which has come from outside as, as sentence modules that are slipped in, in crucial places that describe a program of the ministry, which then attracts a budget from that government. Uh, and I think this is probably the most sinister aspect of what has happened uh, over the last 15 to 20 years that our processes of, not only our processes of thinking for ourselves have been directed, managed and manipulated, but the ways in which we describe whatever it is that we have thought are themselves channelized through this subversive language, which then purports to represent what we are. You know, really, when you said that, I just immediately thought of education. And there's all yeah. this jargon, these buzzwords, these loaded yeah. terms when, yeah. you know, uh, we talked about my friend Charlotte Thompson Israby, the deliberate yeah. dumbing down of America. And you can go back and I've got all her files. Some of this stuff is goes back to the 60s. And it's, it's all very loaded. Like, you know, when they talk about community schools, it sounds like it's all about you know, this grassroots thing, but it really is about public-private partnerships with all these multinational companies. And so, like you said, most people are just using these terms because it's it's the trendy thing or it's it's the sort of the uh, baseline language that's and it comes down from the Department of Education or the, the faculty administrator or this, the, you know, the, the state government or the federal government or whatever. And so you just hear this term all the time. It's like, oh yeah, that's that community stuff. And you know, they don't, they don't really know the history of it in the broader context. So let me ask you this. So do they, to what extent does UNESCO or any of the UN agencies, to what extent do they provide funding for the projects in, the, in their various uh, national regions? So like, do, how much of the bill do they foot or do they basically just come in with like here's our sdg program figure it out and report back to us like how, how what's the how does that work financially well i mean that's the, <laughs> that is uh the million rupee question really 
uh, and that's the question that that's the question that should preface any consultation that any ministry has had with any UN agency. Unfortunately, this, this question should have been asked at that level 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And uh, I don't know whether it was asked and presumably if, if it was asked, the person asking it has been sacked or removed. Um, because it is, it has been a very well managed, sophisticated replacement of what has been the indigenous or rather the endogenous thought process of any country relating to its own circumstance, replaced by uh, what is a homogenized normative standardized uh, package of practices and implementations, which then takes the place of uh, what a ministry's program is. And, excuse me. And uh, that has been the vehicle for exactly what you described, which is this great menu of loaded terms and concepts, uh, which in, in, in its own way has replaced our terms and concepts which have a cultural basis, which are culturally grounded, and which describe what our experience is. What those terms and concepts do is not describe anything that is intrinsic to our identity. Uh, this, may be, this may be possible at the community level to keep it separate, but once it gets into the ministerial uh, communication, then everything subsequently, refers to where it began and where it began to be used and where it concurrently was used and how it subsequently was used. And that's how it takes on a life of its own. And that is why even when you look at, uh, for example, um, the way any message, any substantial message from any UN agency concerning one of its conventions or declarations or programs, there is a great preamble which uh, comes at the outset, which reinforces these terms and concepts. Um, I'll try and look for something that, uh, oh, one minute, I have to share the screen. I'll try and look for something that uh, explains this better. Okay, let's, let's use this as an example. This is not uh, uh, the ideal example that I would be looking for. I, I, I do have them and I'm trying to try and pull out uh, one or two and send them. But this explains what I'm trying to um, illustrate here. So the preamble gives the background in a very weighty and ponderous manner that we have done so much, we have convened so many meetings, we have gathered so many experts, we have analyzed and we have aggregated the reports of so many uh, meetings, uh, so many decisions have pointed in this direction, and therefore we are presenting the net result of it to you in order to mow you down and overwhelm you with the academic and moral weight of all that we are presenting before you. So UNESCO convenes periodic global education meetings aligned with the meeting schedule of the high level political forum on sustainable development and so on. So for the <coughs> excuse me for the average functionary in a ministry he or she is completely overwhelmed by this because it signals to him or to her that i am that i am in a position where i am completely awed by all that has gone before me because it has been done by minds which are much greater than mine and therefore, I must submit in order to keep my bosses happy, keep my superiors happy, and assure myself that I will continue to be in this seat that I occupy for the next year at least. So, you know, if basically, you know, all they're doing is sort of pushing, the, if UNESCO and the UN and their other agencies are pushing this big PR campaign 
that basically just divert your budget and your resources to this homogenized international agenda. Like, what is what is the incentive of a of a, of the ministries or the local communities to participate? But at least part of what you're saying is that the PR campaign itself comes with this sort of, like you said, all this weight of, you know, look at all these experts and all this data and all this, this history. And so, you know, and, and look at, look at, look at the progress we're making, you know, don't, you, you want to get on board with this thing. And, and then it's sort of like a peer pressure thing, uh, which, which, you know, I could speak to just from my own experience in my own department, but is, is there more to it or is that pretty much what, what gets people on board with the program? It's, it's a puzzle really, John, because it's a puzzle for me because uh, I have met uh, and had to work with so many different kinds of administrative functionaries uh, over the last 20 years in ministries um, at, at uh, different levels. And uh, I would say that um, the originality in thinking that I have seen or been able to witness, uh, now that it's not been there, it's been less common than I would imagine, but uh, it's not been absent. But where I have seen it is at levels of administration or levels of governance, which don't even know about the existence of these UN agencies. They have no idea that there's this such and such UN agency which has a program like this. They have absolutely no idea. They're very connected with what they need to do locally in a district or even in a sub-district or even in a small town. And as in, in a very natural, organic way, they gather what they need to know from the people who are on the ground, who are ordinary citizens, ordinary residents. And uh, through the process of conversations uh, which have nothing to do with their official capacity they they take decisions on the spot and uh, in in full view of everybody else and that's where i've seen real issues and questions of developing development being addressed normally and naturally once you go one or two levels above uh, this very uh, organic natural layer that's when the effect of what I described earlier starts becoming visible. Because those are usually the ranks. I mean, and I'm saying this regardless of country, because I've seen this in, in different parts of Southeast Asia, in parts of island Southeast Asia, in West Asia, Central Asia, in uh, parts of those parts of Europe where I've had to deal with uh, uh, projects and programs concerning UNESCO. Uh, and I think this is universal that once you get into those levels of administration where uh, the administrative career is something that has to be protected, then that's when they begin to subscribe to these, uh, these weighty uh, observations and these uh, morally uh, very attractive routes of uh, describing their uh, actions. Uh, because then they have a they have a career interest, but they may also have other interests uh, which are not theirs, uh, but they have been contacted to represent. As we talk about the business world, who are uh, a big player in the development industry. And so then, so then maybe some of these other opportunities, whether it be for career or or status or whatever, but. But they can also rub elbows with some of these these companies or these foundations that that are part of these UN contracts. I mean, that could be another incentive as well, especially if you want to, you know, climb the career ladder, right? So since we since we touch on you mentioned the foundations and, and the multinational corporations, what, are, are there any in particular that that's, that's have stood out to you in your experience? as far as big players who have partnered with these UN uh, agendas, programs? Yes, I'd have to say the, the one that uh, has been a persistent demon uh, in the areas of food and agriculture uh, and the area of health in India 
is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which uh, emerged as a uh, development player in India um, almost 20 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, it, uh, at the outset, it started its work in some of the states of Eastern India. Um, and I have to say at that time, the, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, the community organizations, the voluntary groups uh, that I knew of uh, in some of those states, uh, in fact, seemed to welcome the entry of this foundation into those, uh, those territories and into those sectors because they seemed to think that uh, it would, in the first place, it would give them a route or an alternative to what they were already doing, which was, um, which would earn them more money, significantly more money as a personal salary or a personal wage. And secondly, it would catapult them into a circuit uh, to which hitherto they did not have access or to which access was very limited. Uh, and so the early work of the Gates Foundation in India seemed to uh, offer these carrots to the uh, NGOs and community-based organizations that existed in those uh, regions and sectors. Uh, and uh, of course, from there, the foundation's work only became um, bigger and more ambitious, uh, the more space it, it captured every year. So certainly from my point of view, I think that is uh, one organization which uh, has loomed very large. The other, which uh, has certainly been around for uh, as long, if not longer, uh, but whose prominence is more recent, maybe about uh, over the last decade, is the World Economic Forum, uh, which has really uh, moved into uh, especially into areas which are dense urban settlements. So cities, metropolises and towns. Um, and the, it is the World Economic Forum as a, in its guise as a non-governmental organization, which has very aggressively pushed to the Indian government and to the state governments, the idea that smart cities is something that uh, needs to demand a large part of different kinds of budgets and be coordinated by uh, extraterritorial agencies, namely itself and its partners, uh, which again is a form of subversion, which, which is one step beyond what the UN agencies do because the UN agency at least has as its justification that a sovereign country is a member of that agency and there is an agreement between them, multilateral agency and sovereign country. But the WEF has no such arrangement, or at least it didn't until even more recently. So the WEF works with through its, its industry collaborators which means uh, in, in most parts of the world, these are uh, what we would call industry associations or special interest groups uh, that have um, very large lobbying cap capabilities uh, by themselves. But what has happened, uh, and this I'm talking about three to four years ago, from the period of three to four years ago till now, is that the WEF has gained enough heft and uh, I suppose um, confidence in dealing with uh, these issues that it has entered into agreements with statutory agencies of a government. For example, we have, you know, what I mentioned earlier was our, our planning commission, which used to, to construct and frame these five-year plans. 
that was replaced in 2014 by an agency which did away with the five year plans and uh, adopted our open ended um, method of planning. So the WEF has an arrangement with that agency, which again is the central planning agency for India. In the same way, the WEF uh, has an arrangement directly with municipalities, so city corporations. So in a way, they have been able to subvert this by approaching their uh, consumers directly without the intervention of the state at all. And I think this is, this is profoundly dangerous because it, it, uh, it totally dilutes uh, all the checks and balances that a democracy has had in place until now. Yeah, I, I remember you mentioned that the WEF was sort of playing this this role of facilitator as an NGO, and I, you know, typically I we think of them as like just a think tank where you know all these heads of state and, and, and corporations and, and, and media people and stuff sort of get together and you know brainstorm some ideas, and then they take those ideas back to either their companies or their constituents, and then they go. But you're saying that they that the WEF as its own agency is basically entering into these these contracts not not even with the with the whole state but sort of by even bypassing the, the, the ministries and going straight into like you're saying local local municipalities and and this is largely for smart city development or at least that's one of their main projects right now that is one of their main projects yes that's one of the main projects and that has a lot to do with uh uh of course, what we've seen uh, take shape over the last, uh, I mean, since early 2020, uh, from the outset of this uh, so-called epidemic and so-called pandemic, um, which uh, has pushed up the idea of internet of things, uh, um, which includes uh, a great deal more, everything that is digital because uh, of the, um, immobilization of huge numbers of people in their cities and towns. Uh, so that has taken on a life of its own, uh, I, I would say, um, a sort of um, yeah, a very disconcerting life of its own. Uh, but in the same way, uh, the WEF has also, it, together with its industry partners, um, has also infiltrated the, the key sectors of industry and commerce and finance. Uh, its key partners being the uh, multilateral uh, funding agencies. So we're talking about the World Bank, IMF, uh, in our part of the world, the Asian Development Bank, for example, in, in South America, it could be the, uh, the um, IADB, the the Inter-American Development Bank uh, in Africa would be the African Development Bank and so on. So these development banks as well. Uh, in order to, and, and this is probably less, very much less visible, to, um, to rejig or to reinvent the ways in which accounting uh, and budgeting are done uh, and are classified so as to benefit the programs of the WEF and uh, what we've uh, come to learn from last year, the fourth industrial revolution, um, which uh, has to some extent already been rolled out in some of these smart cities. Uh, and the, the way in which that ties in with what the UN agencies uh, have been doing more recently to try and show with this um, with this uh, screen grab, all right. Yep, so this is something called Paris Declaration, which uh, a, this is a draft, which is it is a near final draft. It is to happen this month, perhaps in a few days. Um, 
So this is, as you see, the title is a global call for investing in the futures of education. And this is uh, the draft declaration that is going to be presented uh, to the those who gather for the global education meeting 2021, which is to, which was scheduled to happen, I think, on the 10th of November, which is uh, where I am. It's tomorrow. Um, uh, we and and you can see <clears throat> there is reference to the agenda. 2030, uh, all the usual um, feel good terminology that uh, we can, we expect will come from a UN agency, marginalized and vulnerable groups and so on. Uh, poverty, remote rural areas, women and girls, all these are the standard uh, terminological concepts that are inserted into this in order to provide the moral basis and justification. But if you look at paragraph number three, we are concerned about the financial impact that the pandemic continues to have on education financing, particularly in low and middle income companies, uh, countries. We recognize that equity, et cetera, et cetera. They reinforce each other when investment in education policies. So this is what is being pushed. Uh, the next part of this document is about directly about invest in education. Again, uh, great emphasis being given to the investment idea. Uh, paragraph eight says, broadly and bluntly, we urge all governments to fulfill without delay their commitments made at the World Education Forum in Incheon, South Korea in 2015 and the previous edition of this global education meeting. Look at that first sub point under number eight, allocate at least four to 6% of GDP and or at least 15 to 20% of total public expenditure to education, total public expenditure. You know, so this is a, this is a demand which verges on or crosses the boundary between being a suggestion and being an extortion. To my mind, it's absolutely amazing that something like this can even be drafted, but it is. It has been drafted and it has been declared in the in the previous meet, the meeting previous to this one simply because of the uh, of the great arm twisting by organizations such as the World Economic Forum and the big philanthropical uh, uh, organizations such as the Gates Foundation, which have done fifteen to twenty years of groundwork in these countries in order to ensure that their representatives agree to this. Yeah, and I mean, and as you mentioned earlier, I mean, it's like, how are you going to tell every country in the world what percent they're supposed to spend on a given aspect of their economy or their society? Like, you know what I mean? Like, everybody's going to have a different basket to play with. And so, you know, maybe, maybe they want to spend more. Maybe they don't want to spend more. You know, I mean, that, that is absurd to do that. But I mean, I would just mention one thing. It's, it's kind of tie everything together that you just mentioned. So, you know, the Gates Foundation is a member of the World Economic Forum. And it also <laughs> partners with UNESCO's Global Education Coalition, which is a, a consortium of big tech education companies. And it's got, you know, all, all the big ones in there, uh, you know, Microsoft, IBM, Google, et cetera. And so, you know, when they're talking about allocating money and the World Economic Forum is brokering this deal, when they talk about allocating that money, pretty sure that's what they're talking about, is spending that money on distance learning, you know, to keep people safe from having to contract the virus and things like that. So again, you're telling people what percentage of their budget they should be spending on X, Y, or Z, and then you're pretty much telling them what to spend it on. So, so you know what I mean? After you give them the chunk that they're forced to spend, then we're telling them where to spend it. And so, you know, it just, it just illustrates everything you said about this top-down approach to all this international aid. Yeah. Yes, I, I, thanks, John. I really must take a closer look at this uh, Global Education Council because um, I did not know that uh, the Gates Foundation was uh, linked to that, uh, but I really must have a look at that. In one of the other slides, uh, we have a reference to NEA, which is National Education Accounts, uh, which is, 
which again through the attack on on uh, sovereign budgets is uh, being introduced so that there will be a national education accounts into which public monies will be poured and from which public monies will uh, disappear into the hands of uh, the wef and its partners so so uh, when you the, tell them that you're spending 20 percent you got to put it in this this national education account and then that gets funneled out to these big tech companies that are members of the wef and unesco yes okay yes okay. and i think this helps describe what this dystopian idea of teaching and learning has already evolved into which is about as far away from what i have been trying to encourage through my work for this unesco convention for the last 12 years in these countries to which i have been called as an expert on intangible cultural heritage or on traditional knowledge systems which has very much to do with the transmission of knowledge, its methods and its symbols, which has to be done in the way and can only be done in the way that has, has been done in order, to have, in order for that knowledge to have existed into the present at all. You cannot do away with that and you cannot replace it by any of these means. Yet over the last year and a half, it is not only, it is UNESCO directly as far as I have experienced, but also these other agencies, which are, have been very emphatically attempting to, 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 emphasize, to, to emphasize that teaching must now be hybrid. They use this word hybrid. And when I ask them, what do you mean by hybrid? Oh, no, we have to have, where it's possible, we have to have in-person learning. What do you mean by in-person learning? Uh, how else is learning? Uh, so it has to be a combination of in-person learning and remote teaching. And uh, my question to them was, look, if I have, if I am an instructor in a rural district in India, and I have expertise in maintaining a coconut orchard, a coconut plantation, and I have to teach people how to climb the tree and how to look for infestation at the, on the crown of the tree, and be able to teach them how to use the particular knife or machete, which cuts them off, cuts the coconuts off. I cannot do that through a video. I have to take a boy up, to, up the tree. If I have to show somebody how to feel the soil in a, rice, in a rice field and decide whether the time has come to employ the, the loose tiller or the, the, the deep tiller, I cannot do that on a video. I have to take that boy there and make him dig his hands in the soil and feel it for himself. And, you know, so this is impossible. Uh, this idea that you can replace virtually what has been done for uncountable generations in the nature that surrounds us is absolutely outright mad. So uh, I, on one of these committees, where they got all this CARES money, the CARES Act is this bill, uh, the COVID stimulus bill over here. So all this money went out and as an adjunct, I was the adjunct representative that was able to put my two cents in on these proposals. And some of the, the proposals for some of this, because the money was largely for purchasing technology that would be used to you know, facilitate learning while we're all locked down. Well, they couldn't have any labs for like the nursing students, okay? And also dental tech, right? And then basically medical stuff. And so everybody wanted to purchase these virtual simulators instead of, instead of having, because they couldn't go and like work with patients like human beings. So they, so they purchased these virtual simulators and it's just like a cartoon on a screen. There's like a, a guy or a girl laying in the bed and then like, you know, his face turns red or some icon pops up, says his temperature is, you know, a hundred something degree. And this is, this is supposed to suffice or supposed to substitute, you know what I mean? Actually uh, uh, diagnosing a human being 
you know, and it, there's no way, there's no way that that cartoon is teaching them how to actually do that. So just like you said, you know what I mean? Like these, these simulators, and now, now Mark Zuckerberg is coming out with his meta, meaning, you know, it's this virtual reality. So it'll be 3D. You're going to put the goggles on and instead of a two-dimensional cartoon, you'll have a three-dimensional cartoon. But again, like, I don't care how, if you got smart, smart shirts and smart go uh, goggles and smart gloves so that it simulates like actually touching a person that there's there's no way that you're gonna even ever get close to uh, you know uh teaching how to do it in, in the real world which leads me to believe that they don't intend for us to be existing in the real world they, they intend for robots to largely automate all the natural resource extraction and everything else will be telework, telehealth, telelearning, you know, meaning all this distance stuff through through a screen. But but yeah, no, I mean it just goes back to what you said about, you know, basically under the guise of helping your local indigenous communities, just flipping the system and then having you plugged into this larger global technocratic uh, apparatus. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed the first half of this interview. For uploading purposes, I had to cut it into two parts. So to catch the second half of this interview, please check out part two. Thanks so much. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you'd like to check out more of my research, go to my website, schoolworldorder.info, where you can find archives of all my interviews, all my articles, and a bibliography of all my citations. There's also links to all my social media and video platforms. And you can sign up for my email list too, where you will receive notifications whenever I produce a new article, interview, or video. To support my work, become a research member for just $5 a month, and you'll gain access to my WebBrain database which contains Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's archive of U.S. Department of Education files and other rare historical documents. The database will be updated with weekly document dumps and you will be notified whenever I upload a new dossier. Thanks again for watching. Peace.